it's always a hassle to, to determine, okay, where do I have to go, where I am, where I'm at at the moment. And so with this movement API implemented in Node.js, you basically are able to just say, move my mouse left by 100 pixels. Hello, welcome to the DevTools FM podcast. This is a podcast about developer tools and the people who make them. I'm Andrew, and this is my co-host, Justin. Hi, everyone. Uh, today, we're joined by Simon, who is the creator of Nut.js. Nut.js is a node library for automating cross-platform native UI. Simon, is there anything uh, you'd like to tell our audience about yourself? Not in particular. So I'm, I'm pretty excited to be on the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're excited to have and you here. I guess that's it. Well, maybe to, to start off with, can you just tell us a little bit uh, about what inspired you to create Nut.js? And maybe if you want to give a better description than what I did, maybe we can start off there too. <laughs> so in, in general, I looked into the topic of desktop automation using JavaScript in yeah around July 2018. And back at that time, I was pretty unhappy with the results I found because well, I wanted to to have something which lasts for a long time or a, a longer time. And especially in the Node ecosystem, that's a bit hard. And so pretty much every library I took a look at was either unmaintained, had failing CI, or yeah, was pretty much dead. And after a while, I decided that, well, I will take a shot at it and started working on Node.js and I did a little prototyping. And when I realized that this could actually work the way I want it, I invested more and more time in it. And well, here we are over three years later and still going. <laughs> That's how it goes. That's how it goes. <laughs> when you when you set out to build the library, was there a particular problem that you were trying to solve? Was there like something very specific that you're trying to work through? So we, basically the main goal I tried to achieve was using it for integration with the web automation tool. So it, basically the, the overall project which, which kind of came together was a combination of a browser automation combined with desktop automation. And all the tools I had a look at were basically lacking the, the whole image recognition stuff. Mm. So finding a library which allows you to automate your mouse or your keyboard input was pretty straightforward. There are actually several out there besides the fact that they are maybe unmaintained, but having, having a tool which allows you to also navigate your desktop by providing template images was non-existent. And well, that's, that's uh, the, the topic I picked up and decided to implement it myself. So does that mean you use Nut.js to do your full automation? You don't rely on something like Playwright or something that's integrated with the browser. You just really more automate the computer running the program. So Nut.js itself is basically more targeting the, the, the whole PC itself. So you're, you're able to, to simulate keyboard inputs. You're able to navigate your mouse around your desktop. And as I uh, just told, it's possible to provide template images and then it would scan your desktop and say, okay, I located it in this area. I will move the mouse to, to this area. And your browser automation was done back in the days with Selenium. And the combination of these both tools um, basically evolved into a separate framework. Yeah, I actually stumbled across uh, not just doing a, a funny sort of thing. One of my cousins passed away in the summer of 2020. He and I used to play RuneScape a lot when we were younger. So I got back into just for nostalgia purposes, just playing some RuneScape. And if anyone has ever played that, it's a browser based game. It used to be like a Jovelet app that ran in the browser. They've since updated it, but it's uh, it's it's a game that's like designed to take as much time as possible. <laughs> like it just takes a ton of time to do anything. It's a point and click type game. And I was like, well, it'd be fun to bot this. It's like, I want to like make my own bot. So I need something to control the keyboard. I need something to control the mouse. And I need some way of like detecting things on the screen. 
And I went about like just looking for node libraries to do this. I ran across something called Robot.js, which like helps control the mouse and keyboard. And then I was really having a hard time trying to find something that would do the display. And I'd run across this like OpenCV library. OpenCV is an open computer vision library that like helps you um, distinguish things on the screen. And all that looked really interesting, but it was like hard to mesh everything together and things were unmaintained. And it was like, it was kind of crusty. And then I come across Nut, which like did all the things that provided this like unified wrapper for everything. And I was like, oh, this is really cool. So I was able to like write my own bot in like an afternoon and it worked really well. And it was, it was pretty fun. That's cool to hear. <laughs> and actually you're not the only one who's trying to bot RuneScape. <laughs> so. With Nut.js specifically? Oh. <laughs> Yes, so I'm I'm um, I'm running an, uh, a Discord server for the for a little Node.js community work, and I think if I remember correctly, there were now at least five people asking me whether I could help them botting RuneScape. Ah, <laughs> and I'm 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 not sure. I I don't want to yeah make any any false statements, but I I guess there's somebody. Making a profit out of it. <laughs> could be, could be. It's definitely gets a terms of service. So if you're bought in, you're going to get banned. But it is also just like a fun technical challenge because there are like specific things that you have to be able to do. It's like detecting where you are in the world and being able to like, you know, control inputs and stuff. Anyway, it was, it was really fun. And I think the abstractions that Nut provides is like being able to really easily capture a piece of the screen and use that as like, hey, if this piece of the screen exists, then you know it's in this state. Wait for this thing to exist. That was like really refreshingly simple. And I think that keyed me into the applications, you know, from a broader context is like especially desktop automated testing. Yeah, that, that was actually also one of the main goals I tried to achieve because it's with many, many automation libraries, you are running into the pro uh, problem that, well, it's possible to do to do things, but everyone will write his own utility functions to make the API enjoyable. And so one of my main goals was to, or at least trying to design an API, which is basically fun to use and gets you off the ground in like a minute or so. So my, my goal was, you look at an example, you grasp the concept, and then you're good to go. So I hope that this works. Yeah, it's it seems like an example of finding the right primitive to make make the program easy to use. And the right primitive in this case just happens to be looking at the screen and recognizing something's on the screen. So that's pretty cool. And also with, with movement, because that's that's something I implemented only after a while, because I, I noticed myself that I want an easier way to navigate my screen. It's always a hassle to, to determine, okay, where do I have to go, where I am, where I'm at at the moment. And so with this movement API implemented in Node.js, you basically are able to just say, move my mouse left by 100 pixels, for example, or um, in combination with this template image matching, it's possible to say, move my mouse straight to the center of the image I'm providing you. And so once the image is located, it will move the, the mouse on a straight line to the center of this image you provided. So it, it works by composing multiple really simple functions, which gives you a pretty powerful and expressive API. What, what, what's something I'm really enjoying. <laughs> there's, a, there's kind of a hard part of automating like automating desktop interactions where the thing that you're interacting with, like say you want to like click an icon. Well, the icon might be transparent. The background might be different. So like selecting that particular icon might be different in different situations. So that, that can be a particularly challenging thing where like a flat screenshot might not be sufficient. So I know that you integrated with the OpenCV library and you're using that under the hood. Is it still all just like flat image matching or do you have any more sort of like robust pattern matching that, that the API can tap into? So at the moment, it's a really simple template matching. 
But maybe as a, a little sneak peek, I'm currently working on an, a new major release. And one of the topics I want to address is making it easier to use Node.js in terms of dependencies. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that I definitely want to improve the image matching part because it, it still has its flaws. So it's, as you just said, for us humans, it's pretty easy to say, that's definitely the icon I'm looking for, but expressing it in code is not that simple. And so I'm, I'm currently looking into yeah, ways to make image matching more reliable, even with scaling applied, maybe rotation applied, stuff like that. Does Nut.js work in CI? Mm, kind of. You still have to provide a, a virtual display, but for example, my integration tests on GitHub are all running using, for example, a virtual frame buffer on a, a Linux host. Nut.js has a, full, a suite of, of full end-to-end uh, -end tests, and these end-to-end -end tests are running inside a Docker container, which provides a virtual display. So it's always booting up the exact same desktop environment, and then I'm dragging icons around on the desktop, verifying their location and stuff like that. But it's, it's doable to run it um, yeah, on CI in the background using, for example, a Docker container. That's pretty cool. That'd be a, a really interesting way to automate like desktop application testing. It's really interesting. Is a, for example, I know from some people that they are using Node.js to actually do um, application testing, but in an environment where they do not have direct access to the system. So basically they are connected by a remote connection and they only have the image information. So they use Node.js and use the, the image matching capabilities to basically verify that yeah, the, the UI they are currently reworking is like they would expect it. Oh, that's really interesting. On the target system. I want to talk a little bit about the native dependency in, in Nut. So you have this library called LibNut. It's written in C, C++. So it implements a lot of the like underlying cross-system functionality, like key press detection, mouse control, you know, screen detection, etc. Can you talk can you just talk a little bit about what it was like developing that library? I mean, I know a lot of people who listen to this probably haven't taken the task of like building a native dependency that works with Node, and I don't think it's always the most straightforward thing to do. Yeah, so it, in general, Node.js has actually two native libraries because the, this whole OpenCV part is a native Node add-on as well. But for the libnut part, so essentially LibNut is a fork of Robot.js, the, the Node framework you mentioned earlier. But unfortunately, this framework is no longer mm -hmm. maintained. So back in the days, I decided to fork it and maintain it myself. That's how LibNut actually came into existence. Over time, I changed quite a lot in the, in the, in the project. So the, yeah, the, I guess the, the most prominent difference to usual node development when it comes to native add-ons is you know, you're dealing with a, a whole different environment re in regards to what kind of build system are you using? Yeah, what kind of language are you using? Uh, how do you distribute a, a native add-on? Because in the end, a native add-on is a binary. So it, you, have to, you have to build a, an add-on for Mac OS, for Linux and for Windows. So there you have to also think about how do I manage my packages so that I can provide three platforms with as little overhead as possible. <laughs> and so the, the changes I applied were basically all learned the hard way because there are also two different ways to develop native add-ons. So the, the initial version or the, the, the initial fork of Robot.js used a tool called native abstractions for node. And um, the problem with these native abstractions for node is that these binaries which are generated are also dependent, dependent on the node.js version you are building them for, which means on every new major release, you will have to run a new build to provide new bindings. And um, the OpenCV add-on I'm using is currently still using this tool because I just haven't had the time to get rid of it because OpenCV for Node.js, so that's the library which provides these bindings, is huge. 
On the other hand, it's the the most complete OpenCV binding you find for Node.js. But well, <laughs> that's a, a different story. With all these with all these problems I was facing, I first of all decided that I would want to use a build system I already knew, so I ditched Node.js and uh, switched over to using CMake.js. So basically just a JavaScript wrapper around CMake. And the second major change I applied was that I did no longer use these native abstractions for Node, but with Node 10, they released uh, the so-called Node API, which is another way to, to build native Node add-ons. But in contrast to native abstractions for Node, you no longer depend on the particular Node version. So now it's possible to build it for, let's say, Node 12, and you can still use it with Node 16 without having to recompile anything. So that was a huge win for me. And also, yeah, lowered the, <laughs> the amount of work I had to, to take care of because, well, I will just build it one time and you can use it with any Node version from 12 upwards you want. Yeah, that's, that's basically it. With these major problems out of the way, it was easily possible to... We had to just continue working on it. And in terms of distribution, that's also something I, I solved in a pretty, I would say, a lazy man's way because I'm <laughs> I'm only published. So I'm basically just patching the package JSON on my CI job. The CI job is running on uh, Linux, Mac OS and Windows using GitHub Actions. And these three published packages are then all incorporated in one, I would say meta package. So there's, there's a, a node package, which is called, for example, libnut win32 for Windows. And this package is a dependency for the overall libnut. And depending on which target platform you're installing libnut, it will basically re-export the bindings for the respective target platform. That's a pretty straightforward way to do it, and it works seamlessly. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I know that Yarn the the package uh, manager had just released a major version where in older versions they had an issue where if you had a, a cross-platform dependency like this they would download all the binaries for all the platforms even if you didn't need it and i i, for, I forget exactly why they did that but there was some complexities and and like system analysis or something that they had to do but they solved that and in, in version three so just i don't know this just made me think of that yes sir. Well, for dealing with, with binary add-ons, there are actually quite a few packages out there. I guess the most prominent at the moment is called Prebuildify. And Prebuildify, if I remember correctly, does something like you just like you just mentioned. So it, it basically keeps or it contains all the binaries for all the platforms. So the, the tool I'm using for the OpenCV bindings is using a bit of a different approach. So it basically, during CI, it generates native bindings for every platform and every node version I want to use it for, and every Electron version. And once the binary is built, it uploads it to the GitHub release. So the GitHub release currently has around 30 binaries attached. And when you install the package, it will check, okay, which target platform am I running on? Which node version am I running? and then grab the respective binary from the GitHub release and um, unpack it in your node modules folder. Yeah, for, for a long time, I didn't know that node packages could work like that. I thought everything was just JavaScript. And I was helping out on a, a project called Package, uh, PKG, and they do the same thing where they have this like separate project that has GitHub Actions that builds their custom version of Node or like an add-on for it. And it's it's like a, a blindingly confusing world for me. <laughs> I think most people, when they look at Node, wouldn't wouldn't even realize that you could do stuff like this inside of Node. Yeah. So most of the time, when when talking to people about the stuff I do in my spare time, they're like, "You're crazy, man! <laughs> Why do you do this?" Yeah, subjecting <laughs> yourself to that pain. <laughs> but actually, now it's. A pretty, a pretty straightforward thing to do because I have all the setup and my development workflow basically consists of, okay, I have finished a new feature. I will just merge the feature branch into develop. And then from dependency to dependency upwards, it will just trigger a new build. It will 
once it's completed, trigger the next dependency, which builds and so on and so on. And in the end, I have a ton of new snapshot releases on NPM with with just a finger snip. Pretty awesome. <laughs> so it, it definitely pays off to invest in these kind of things. Yeah, the, the, the those type of workflows that GitHub Actions has enabled are just like awesome. Like being able to just run on a Windows machine with like little to no effort is A+. plus. Yeah. Definitely. Also, without GitHub Actions, I wouldn't be able to develop Node.js because I'm, I'm only running a Mac and it's not feasible to build all the binaries on my on my machine. I do wonder about, there are some languages that, that do a pretty good job of building cross-platform binaries. So like Zig and Go, I think, are in, in two in particular that do a decent job of doing... Uh, cross-platform compilations. I don't exactly know how that works. I'm not sure like what the exact details are there, but I just saw uh, a tweet today, I think, that was about the CLI framework for Elixir, where they use Zig under the hood to make it where you can compile a cross-platform CLI framework in Elixir for just like any any system or whatever. I don't know, it just seems like magic to me. I only read about it, so especially from, from Go people who are basically always <laughs> telling me that, oh, yeah, look, I'm, I will just change my target architecture and then I run Go build and it will just spit out a binary for a different target platform. But so far I haven't looked into cross-platform builds. That's so it would reduce the amount of, of CI work I have to do or the, the amount of work I'm, I'm using, but I simply haven't found the time to invest. Seems like a non-trivial effort. <laughs> Most likely. So we talked a little bit about two examples of things you've seen automated with Nut.js, one being your like test automation and the other being apparently RuneScape's very popular. But what are some other cool examples you've seen out there in the wild and on your Discord of what things people are doing with Nut.js? So. I guess one of the things I'm most proud of, I'm not sure whether it's okay that I, I brag about it in here, but um, looking at the, the projects on GitHub, which are using Node.js, one of them is the VS Code extension tester developed by Red Hat. <laughs> when I noticed that Red Hat started using my package, I was, yeah, it, it kind of blew my mind because Red Hat was like one of the first companies which brought me in touch with, with like open source software using their Linux distribution uh, now almost 20 years ago. And that, yeah, that was pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, given given the fact that they are developing like this um, VS Code extension tester, which is used in obviously pretty much VS Code extensions. Now, the software I'm building ends up being used in projects developed by companies like Microsoft or Intel or SUSE, which is another Linux distribution I used in my really, really early days of Linux. So that's pretty amazing. <laughs> and all just developed by one single guy sitting in like the middle of nowhere in Southern Bavaria. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool that something you just like made in your free time just to scratch an itch is now being used to power probably like thousands of projects if it's used in the VS Code extension tester. Definitely. Yeah, it's definitely the beauty of open source. Then, I, yeah, I just wanted to say exactly that. That makes every open source enthusiast's heart beat. <laughs> <laughs> it can also be pretty stressful. Now, now you're dependent on by thousands and thousands of people. <laughs> Got to step lightly. Yeah, it it changes a bit. That's definitely true. So seeing that there are a lot of people using stuff you're building puts quite a lot of pressure on you. But at at the moment, it's it's still bearable. <laughs> so I do have to ask, where did the name come from? What? What inspired the naming of, of Node.js? <laughs> That's a pretty lame story because I started developing Node.js with the prototype name of native UI testing. And then it evolved into native UI toolkit. And then I looked at it and 
said oh, the first three letters are basically not okay then i one evening i sat down and, and started drawing this walnut logo on my ipad and well i just went with it <laughs> nice nice that's awesome that you you made the logo too we made the logo for our podcast and, I, and i'm i'm proud of that <laughs> <laughs> I even have my own stickers on my. On oh, my there you go. <laughs> <laughs> we still have to do swag. That's that's, a... th th that's the benefit of of having uh, your yeah, own logo. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, y you obviously have a, a passion for for automation. Uh, what are other things that have you have you like tried just automating other things in your life? Do you like use automation in other places? Not in regards to home automation, because. When it comes to this, yeah, I'm relying on boring old mechanical stuff. I, I do not want to wire up my, my oven to, to my Wi-Fi because that makes no sense in, in my opinion. But yeah, in, with regards of software, I'm trying to automate basically what's possible. So in, for example, a few years ago, I noticed that I haven't updated my CV in quite a while. And once I finished university, I was in the process of yeah, sending out uh, applications. And then I noticed, oh, damn, I have to update my, my CV. And I haven't done it in like six years. A ton of stuff happened in between. I should do this on a regular basis. And that's when I decided that the easiest way for me to keep track of what I'm doing was to put it in a Git repository. So now I have my CV in a LaTeX file in a Git repository. And then the next thing was, I do not want to build the PDF file every time I apply some changes. So now I hooked up a build job to my repository, which spits out a PDF using LaTeX MK. And to make the, the whole story, I then decided that it would also be nice to, once I validated that the output does not look screwed, I could just publish it. <laughs> and so now I'm verifying using Im image matching that some of the, the key points in this PDF where I know that they should be at the exact same position on every page, otherwise the layout is screwed. Once that is in place, I can just go ahead and, and publish my PDF file to my server, and then it's available to the public. So these these are really the, the kind of things I, I'm enjoying in my spare time. <laughs> kind of strange for other people, but that's, yeah, it, it just gives me joy. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's always really fun to be able to find a problem that you can solve with code that you might not otherwise be able to solve. So like in your case, it was updating your resume. But my, my favorite story to share from my past is I wrote a s script to help me win Coachella tickets. So the a local radio station was running a campaign where they, in the morning, announce three artists that they were going to play back to back that were all playing at Coachella. And then you'd have to call in and be like the seventh caller. And then you got two Coachella tickets. And I was like, wow, that sounds like a programming problem to me. So like I... Like after work, I went straight to my computer and was able to use, uh, I used Twilio to send out text messages to people. And then I, I hacked into Shazam and where they store the notifications on my computer. And I read from the SQLite database where it's all stored. And I was able to read which, which artists had been recognized from the playing radio stream on my computer. And then it would blast out a text to me and all my friends. And I was able to win four four Coachella tickets doing that. <laughs> that that's the story I tell when I want uh, I tell people that programming is useful outside of making programs. <laughs> A former colleague of mine did quite this exact same for the football World Cup in two thousand and eight, where it was in in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, if I remember correctly. He, he won a, a radio contest. <laughs> Yeah, so the in the in the World Cup before, <laughs> if I remember correctly, and I'm not sure whether it's okay to tell this that story, he <laughs> basically paid his son to get up whenever he his ticket alarm went off, and then his son had to to go to the computer and <laughs> basically claim the ticket, and in the next during the the next event he then automated also that 
that piece as well. Yeah, that's a different <laughs> form of automation using your children as as workers. <laughs> as long as it works. Yeah. <laughs> that's the that's the the type of automation that comes with experience. It's you're like, I know how much work this is. I'm just going to get somebody else to do this <laughs> for me. <laughs> the next tier of automation. Well, for speaking about the next tier, this is something that we've we've talked about uh, to different people in the past, and it's sort of a generic question, but but we'll ask you too. What do you think the the future of the web will look like? What do you like when you envision that? What does it look like to you? So I'm, I would say I'm both pretty confident about the future of the web because especially seeing stuff like uh, yeah Photoshop entering the web or for example applications like figma so figma runs in the browser just as smooth as it would on a, on a desktop so i'm pretty sure that the web will in the near future evolve into the universal platform so i'm, I'm betting on that <laughs> maybe you would need a pretty expensive macbook to just run your browser because every everything else is on the browser but the things we are capable right now performing in the browser are already pretty impressive. And I guess that this will only increase in the future. And well, on the other hand, I'm a bit hesitant because it basically boils down to three big companies steering the web because there's only Chrome, Firefox and Safari left. Safari being like the yeah the odd little brother who who wants to who wants to play as well, but in in essence, so Firefox and Chrome are basically yeah deciding over the web, and that's maybe not the best thing to do because, in my opinion, something like yeah some something that big as the World Wide Web should definitely have more people to decide upon its its future yeah definitely is the the leaks from the uh google's monopoly antitrust case are showing that i mean even though yeah. you know people from the chrome team have expressed goodwill and intent it looks it looks dicey i mean it definitely looks like google is doing what I guess it makes monetary sense for them and using Chrome as a sort of lever to operate and, and gain more information, you know, get more analytics for ads ultimately. So yeah, I, I definitely, I definitely wish there was more competition in the space, but you know, building a browser is hard. So, you know, it's, it's a yeah, definitely. technical problem. And I think, in some ways we've we've all benefited from the rise of chromium and the the you know it, it's it's pushed the state of the web forward a lot but you know it's not without its cost so yeah I'm with you touch on what you said about needing a powerful macbook there are projects out right now that do aim to to like solve that have you heard of mighty browser Nope. Mighty browser is literally your browser in the cloud. So instead of running the code on your machine in your browser locally, it's all run on really powerful machines in the cloud. And then the updates are just streamed to your browser. So you could have a potentially a netbook and still be running Figma at 60 frames per second. So that, that's basically the, these remote gaming services from, yep. from NVIDIA and, and so on. Very similar. But turn turned into into browser <laughs> yeah makes sense so last question i was browsing your website and your blog and i noticed that you built a progressive web app for your wedding uh i'm i'm going to be getting married here in the next few years and <laughs> my family was joking that i would probably start building my own wedding website too so why why did you do that uh did it go well? Did people actually use it? Do you still go back to it? Is it like a, a little memory in time that you can go visit? <laughs> yeah. So why did I build it? I guess because I equally love building stuff as I like automating stuff. <laughs> that was just my 
I I thought about what we we could need for our wedding, and one of the central problems is always that you have to get uh, information out to your guests, and so I decided well the most the easiest way would be to just slam it on a website, and then I started thinking hmm. But if I'm building a website, then maybe I can take it a step further. And the one thing I was was really sensitive about is that when it comes to to, to private events such like my wedding, I'm I'm really conservative when it comes to privacy. So I do not want any photos of my wedding flying around Facebook, for example. And that's when I came up with this idea that one of the the coolest things you actually do at a wedding is you express your gratitude to, towards the yeah the, the I don't know the English term <laughs> so towards the, the the bride for example but you wouldn't do this in necessarily in public because that's also something really really personal or maybe you want to share your own pictures from the from this particular wedding to give the the bride the like your 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 personal view on this on the on her very very special day, and so I came up with this idea that I would want to have a progressive web app which allows our guests to upload either little messages or pictures, but with this little twist that every single guest was only able to see its, his own content, so everyone was able to to post pictures and it didn't matter which kind of pictures because he was the only one who would see it despite me and my wife because in our stream all the uh, all the combined pictures and, and messages from all of our guests were assembled so we were able to to follow along the stream of, of pictures of all of our friends while everyone was basically yeah preserving his own his own privacy and yeah i'm still coming back to this app every once in a while because it's sweet memories <laughs> <laughs> I, I might fork your app for my wedding. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, I can definitely recommend it because it's it was a really, really nice experience because you could really feel that people were not concerned about, can I post this? Mm, what do other people think? Who can see this? Might I get in trouble? It was just like, you know, I'm super happy to be here and I love you guys. I have a wonderful night and, and stuff like that. It's that's yeah, it, it's on a, a, a different level if you can make sure that it's really something you share in, in privacy. And if we just had a little QR code inside this little little uh, um, table table info card, everybody would just scan it with their cell phones and off they go. Cool. I think with that, we can start heading into the tooltips. So my first tooltip of the week is updated docs for react it's hooks have been out for almost three years now crazy and crazy. yeah crazy it's been out so long and in the react docs there's basically just one page that tells you how to use hooks and the rest of the docs tell you to use class components and to use basically the legacy react api so over probably the course of the last year or two rachel neighbors I think one of the people on the React documentation team and uh, a bunch of open source contributors have been building this new React Docs website, which looks nice and bubbly and Reacty, but it also has a bunch of tutorials that are interactive and walk you through learning React. And everything is hooks focused now, so it's a lot easier to wrap your head around what's going on and for new people in the ecosystem to come and start learning. So if you haven't checked out React Docs before, now's the time. Great. And yeah, the website is beta.reactjs.org at the moment. It will be in the show notes. Indeed. And I will not forget to publish the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> we can only hope. Indeed. So my share this week is this library called Figma Export by GitHub user Marco Mon. Talbino, 
We'll, we'll go with that. So this is a, an interesting thing that I ran into at work. We have a set of icons stored in Figma and I want to automatically export them so that I don't have to manually do this. Figma has a really great API, but it's not something that I wanted to faff about with. So this library, Figma export, gives you a CLI and a set of libraries that let you export things from Figma in different ways. So you just go to Figma, you get an API key, and then you basically you know, put in the file ID, which is part of the URL, and then what page that you want the, the icons or whatever you're exporting to be exported. And yeah, you wire it all up, run the CLI command, and it'll just write everything out. So right now I'm working on a PR to have all of our SVGs exported as a uh, React component. And it, it like works really well. It's like super good. There's also, oh, that, that's nice. yeah, there's also a, like the ability to export styles as like CSS variables and stuff. So potentially like doing design tokens if you're building a design system. So yeah. A lot of cool stuff. Yeah, it would, it would be cool. I don't know if it already does this, but if it uh, runs SVGO on these, because icons are rarely ever optimized and it's always good to run them through SVGO. So it has two types of plugins for this. It has outputters, which like change the, the output format. So you can do like React components and stuff like that. And it has transformers. So you, and their one transformer that they have right now is for SVGO. So yeah, you can oh, run through SVGO go. and do optimizations that way. Yeah, this seems like a no-brainer way to to maintain your design tokens. There's an interesting question about like, I mean, at the point that you set up a script like this, you you put an implicit dependency on things like how you name components in Figma or how you name icons in Figma and then what they are represented in <laughs> as code. And, you know, there's an argument to be made that that's a fragile coupling because, you know, it's it's hard to know if you've made breaking changes or whatever. But there's also something to be said about, like, things like falling out of sync and how much of a just an absolute pain that can be. So, I don't know. I want to think about it a little bit more and figure out how to make this more of a scalable process. But for right now, this is so, so, so much better than, like, manually exporting every single stinking icon can't tell you how long that takes. It's awful. <laughs> First, make it work, then optimize yeah, later. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I, I've de I've gone through the process of teaching our designers back at Intuit about Semver and getting them to not make breaking changes. That's that's a challenge. <laughs> Definitely an education issue. Yeah. I think it's one of those things when, when you're developing a design system that you just have to come to an understanding of like the things that are important, the things that are changeable, you know, it, it's part of the work. Next up, we have Lerna Audit. Yes. So that's my first tooltip I brought today. And that's a little, little bit, a little helper NPM utility package called Lerna-Audit. And it's uh, developed by a former colleague and friend of mine called Tim. Shout outs to Tim. And it basically helps you when you're managing a monorepo using Lerna. And in case you want to run an NPM audit or an NPM audit fix on this monorepo, you will run into trouble because NPM fix will try to download your interpackage dependencies from the registry where they are not yet. And Lerner Audit is basically a little wrapper tooling around it, which takes care of managing managing all the, the package dependencies. So you can successfully run Lerner Audit on every of your sub packages and later on putting everything back in place. So it saved us a ton of time and in, a, in one of our projects and it's enjoying full to reuse. So I can only recommend it. Yeah, that's awesome. Except that you're using yarn in the workspaces because I heard that there, this should not be such a, a trouble. Even though Yarn and now NPM are implementing workspaces, I still find myself wanting to use Lerna in, in most of my mono repo projects. So it's, it's good to have tools like this. And so since we've been talking a lot about automation, I thought I'd share the automation framework I've been using to, to test the share pages at Descript. And we landed on Playwright because Playwright, it the cool thing about it to me is that you can test almost any target. So 
You can test on Safari through WebKit. You can test on Firefox. Of course, you can test on Chrome, but you can also test on Electron. Since Descript is an Electron app, it's good to have the option to be able to use the same testing framework for our Electron app. And then one cool thing that the last time I looked at Playwright they didn't have is they have this Playwright test package, which is a test runner that's built around Playwright. So it works really well. It can run things in parallel. It has tests and expect just like any other framework you might have. And I've been enjoying using it. People might be familiar with Puppeteer. Puppeteer is kind of the uh, older version of this. Actually, a lot of the team that works on Playwright used to work on Puppeteer. There was some like sort of drama around that. I'm not sure exactly what happened, but Puppeteer was, I believe, a Google project. And then a lot of the devs that worked on that project like abandoned ship and went to Microsoft and, and restarted the team and just used a lot of the lessons that they had gained from Puppeteer and applied them to, to Playwright. It was very little setup to get everything going. Like in my initial stab at this, I went through just Playwright and it was kind of kind of hard to juggle and it, it was an extra layer of abstraction that made things kind of harder to understand. This, it's it's very simple. It doesn't require you messing with like any TypeScript configs or Babel configs or anything. It, it just works. So I highly recommend. Yeah, that's definitely something on my list to check out. So we, currently I'm only using Cypress. But yeah, it would be nice to get experience with Playwright as well. Yeah, you, you don't you don't get the nice UI that you get with Cypress, but it still works really well. Okay, so my second tool tip of the day is, and I got my last tool tip, I guess, is an article and a tool from Anthony Fu. So if you're not familiar with Anthony Fu's work, he is one of the developers behind Windy CSS, which is a Tailwind-like CSS thing. I think it inspired the, the JIT uh, mode in Tailwind. So he's working on a new project now called Uno CSS. And, and he has this article that he's written sort of about it that I'll, I'll link in the show notes. But it, it's this is essentially an engine for a Tailwind-like framework for powering atomic CSS. But it, it's it's very flexible. It's really, really easy to modify. It doesn't come with uh, a whole lot of like opinions or, or configurations out of the box. So you could build something Tailwind like with it, but it's not like it's not Tailwind, right? So if you want to have like your margins and paddings and stuff, you can add a rule to do that, but it's not you know, sort of there out of the box, but it's very flexible, very fast and, and sort of a really interesting abstraction. They're they're experimenting with using this as the engine for Windy CSS v4. So, you know, if this is something that interests you, like using this mechanism for doing styling, definitely check it out. Andrew, if you scroll to the bottom of this, there is a really interesting mechanism that is in Windy CSS that they're adding to this. Sorry, did they, have, did they talk about attribute mode somewhere? I thought. Attributify mode? Yeah, attributify mode. This is really interesting where you can have, instead of doing like a bunch of classes, you can actually do attributes in line on the element. So it looks very similar to maybe uh, styled component or styled systems, I guess, if you're used to styled systems, but it's actually, you know, still just base CSS. Those attributes actually get put on the, the, the actual underlying elements. Anyway, there's just a, a lot of really interesting functionality that this, this framework or this sort of CSS build tool enables. Definitely, uh, definitely worth checking out. Yeah, it looks like this attributify mode helps kind of with your one, one of the one of the things you encounter pretty quickly with Tailwind CSS is that your class name gets really, really long. And then even just figuring out what's in that class name is hard because it's a string that stretches past the the 80 character mark by a lot usually. Yeah. This, this could help. It's not shown here, but they actually have it where you can just do like inline attributes. So instead of doing class equals BG blue 400, you could just do button BG blue 400 as like a Boolean attribute and they can like target the styles for that as well, which I thought that was like super cool. Oh, so this, like I was assuming for like the past minute that this would, there's like a tool that takes the attributes and then turns them into classes. But no, this is the, the style sheets actually just target those attributes. Yep. yep. That's awesome. That's, that's exactly what it does. Yeah. It just, I mean, it's, it's all just straight CSS. It's just like changing the selectors. 
yeah attributes are uh the uh, hidden art to styling things yeah. a gr great way to get around a lot of limitations in react too yeah i mean it'll mess with your specificity and then if you're using typescript with react then you need to like worry about like you know doing props and all that stuff yeah. which is like a whole thing not discounting yeah. the complexity there but it seems really interesting whole different can of worms okay the last tool tip of the day yeah that's something i want to check out in the future which has been recommended to me in a twitch channel and I came across that tool when I was preparing slides for the last conference I spoke at, and I was using Reveal.js by default because I'm kind of used to it. But people on the on the Twitch channel recommended that I should take a look at Sly.dev, which is essentially something similar to Reveal.js, but um, it's built using Vue and Vite and also Windy CSS and is pretty extensible and provides some pretty neat features. Like you can record your your presentation with your camera picture in picture. So that's definitely something I want to take a look at in the near future because yeah, Reveal.js is nice, but if there is something else out there which is even nicer, it's definitely worth a look. Yeah, so Slidev, for those who might have not used Reveal.js, Slidev is a way to use, like, to write slides as a markdown. And it you sort of, like, have a document, and it renders it out really prettily. prettily. Interesting note about this, this is also written by Anthony Fu, the, the same person who, who did the, the last tooltip. So very productive member of the community. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've said it before, but we need to get him on. Yes, for I, sure. I think he'd be a good guest. For sure. Anthony, if you're listening, we're coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I think that about wraps it up for this week's episode of DevTools FM. Thanks for coming on. This was a fun chat about all things automation. Once again, thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah. Thanks again, Simon. Be sure to follow us on YouTube and wherever you consume your podcasts. Thanks for listening.